you. I'll take that time. All right. I hope everybody's okay with that. We can use it. Okay. Does somebody want to remind everybody what the old definition of ONT risk was? Why don't you raise your hand first and then I can call on you. Anybody? Okay, go ahead, Salman. I believe it was anything that's not, that doesn't fall, any risk that doesn't fall within either credit risk or market risk. That's right. That, that's, that's good. It used to be just sort of like what's not there. Uh, but the enhanced definition that we talked about, ONT risk is the risk of loss resulting from inadequate or failed internal processes, people, systems, or from other external events. Okay, so it's really, they're not losses that are incurred in the normal course of doing business. They're mistakes. Now, for the time being, we'll always refer to op loss and we'll mean that it's a financial loss, okay? Um, that may be pretty self-evident, but throwing that loss on is important. Now, Operation losses, there's, there's a category that is very important that are not included in ops losses, okay? Does anybody remember what that was? Let's see if anybody's raising their hand. Let me talk to Evan Chen. Do you remember? Uh, sorry, I don't really remember that. Okay. Anybody else? Would that be like opportunity cost? That's right. That's exactly right. Was that you, Alondra? Yes. Okay. That's, that's good. I'm glad that you remember that because that's very important throughout the class. If something happens and something blows up, and people have to stop selling something, the lost revenue that they don't get, that they forfeit because something blew up is not included as an operations loss. Okay. Let me try to show you a picture here. Professor, I have a quick question. Yeah. Are you... Are you going to be taking attendance? Well, you know, there's only a couple people that I really wanted to ask about. So we'll do it this way. Aziz, are you there tonight? Are you with us? Okay. How about Aaron? Are you with us tonight? Uh, yes, I'm just... Uh, under the weather, so I'm not going to be participating. But were you here last week? I don't think you were, right? Yes, I was. Okay. And then the last one is Yu Han. Last name is Z Zhang. Yu Han Zhang. Okay. So a couple of people I think may have dropped the class. Aside from that, Zoom will tell me who was here. So I don't want to spend a lot of time doing the, uh, the uh, um, roll call unless we really have to. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, so we is here as well. I'm using uh, my phone. So my, my phone just may, may be showing instead of uh, my name. I, I didn't the get that. that. Say that again. Uh, I am using, I'm dialing in my uh, phone. So yeah. uh, in that show, uh, my name is Wilbur Savina. Oh, okay. Are you area code 347? 
Correct. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Uh... Okay. This is a busy sheet that was in a Wells Fargo annual report. And this is just one of the multitude of places that they report their expenses, okay? Uh, where I have the arrow here next to operating losses, that's what we're talking about. And that's pretty much where they're put on the income statement. And you can get a sense of the magnitude of operating losses compared to uh, the other types of losses. Um, we have like 1.8 1, 1. billion in operating losses, but then salary expenses, 16 billion. Um, commissions, same thing to people are 10 billion. Now, this doesn't include any cost of funds that they have, but this is all of their other costs. Op operating losses are big, you know, they're almost $2 billion, but they're not as big as the other expenses. Then there's a little blurb there that says operating losses were up 622 million or 50%. Operating losses were up 50% in 2015 compared to 2014. And up 52% in 2014 compared to 13 predominantly due to litigation expense each year for various legal matters. Now, we, we touched on this just briefly last week and, and we'll touch on it again uh, later. But the problem that Wells Fargo had was, does anybody remember? I'm gonna raise their hand. Not you again, Sal Salman, but thank you. Pramvera, okay. you're all the time too. So let's get somebody else. All right, I'm going to pick somebody. Uh, Ban Shun. Um, do you hear me, Professor? Yes, I can hear you. Um, it was primarily legal expenses because of the scandal that they had. That's right. And do you remember much about the scandal? Um, they were, the employees were opening fake accounts. Um, that, that's right. Yep. Yeah, just to um, satisfy their, I guess, their goals of opening accounts and bringing in the funds. Yeah, their sales goals. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what happened there is that if you're, if you have your sales team opening up all sorts of fake accounts, then it's not good for the bank. <laughs> from a regulatory perspective, from a PR perspective, public relations perspective, or anything else. And so what they're saying there is that you know, those are the losses relate, related to litigating all that, a couple of billion dollars. And that's probably um, an overstatement of how much was there for litigation expenses. There would be other expenses related to this. Um, the point is, is that the expenses are broken out separately. Now, um, let's say you run a business, you're a business manager in one of the business lines. Okay, and so you have people reporting to you, you're your marketing person, your, uh, your credit policy person, your finance person, compliance, all those people are working for you. Um, I lost my train of thought. All right, we'll keep moving. It'll come back to me. Primary. Yeah, it's uh, coming back. To, yeah, what's that? Essentially, the other, you know, uh, managing everything will have to be all those different departments. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. At that primer. Yeah. I can look at that right. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's say you are that business manager, <clears throat> and there's all sorts of uh, overtime expenses um, related to um, lots of business. That you're a sales group, and you uh, are selling products, and you're selling so much that um, it's kind of blowing up your system with overtime expenses and you uh, want to know where to record that expense. Would that be a business as usual expense, all that overtime expense, or would that be an ops loss expense? Uh, that would be an ops loss. It's just one time. It's not well, operational. It's not, it's not operational? No. So then it would not be an ops loss? Uh, not technically, like depend if it's, so basically you hiring those because they're technically contractors, you're going over time, you're paying them hourly, you're getting them on a schedule, let's say one year, and that you're forecasting that cost just for that one year and that's non-operational. It stops after one year. Yeah, I think, I think we're on the same page here that um, having a lot of sales to where it, it sort of blows up your operations group is not a bad problem necessarily to have, okay? You, you wanna maximize your sales as much as possible. Uh, it's too bad that you didn't staff accordingly, but um, you know, it, it was a good, good, news story that caused all the overtime. Okay, so we'll just stick that into salary expense. Okay, um, question two then, or scenario two. Wait, so professor, so that would not be an operations expense then, correct? That's correct, that's okay. correct. Because you know, it was something that was done in the normal course of business and it was actually right. a result of something good. Okay, right. there are overtime expenses. That's a drag, that's a bummer. But the fact is, is that they're just regular overtime, regular salary expenses for a good cause. But then the scenario too, is that there is a lot of overtime because uh, processes weren't clear, um, roles and responsibilities weren't clear. It took everybody a long time to do their job and there was a lot of overtime there, okay, because of that. So, Sylvia, I see your picture, but I don't see you. In that scenario, Sylvia, is that an ops loss or is that just a regular expense? Sorry, can you repeat? Sure, okay, you have, two kinds of salary expenses. The first one we had overtime because we were doing a lot of business. Hip, hip, hooray, okay? Now the second scenario is we have a lot of overtime because roles and responsibilities were not clearly defined or a process wasn't clearly defined. So we had the same amount of overtime expenses, but for a different reason. Now we decided that the first level of overtime expenses were just regular expenses. How about the second group where there was not stuff that was clear, roles and responsibilities weren't clear. What about that expense? Is that a regular expense or is that an ops loss? I can't hear you now. The second one that you say. It's an ops loss. Yes. Okay. It's, a not, it's an ops loss because it really wasn't an expense in the normal course of business. Uh, let me well, see. It's really it didn't losses. bring any money in anyway. It wasn't for extra sales either. It was just because they didn't do their job properly. Yeah, it, it wasn't, wasn't outlined properly. So it's yeah, not it wasn't, that they it brought in any extra sales or anything like that. Yeah, it wasn't, it, in the second scenario, it was not a good story. Whereas the first scenario wasn't the story. Um, so if you're an engineer, 
and say um, your machinery or what you work on with on site had problems that were outside of your control. But because of that, uh, more hands on deck is needed. Is that going to be um, an op loss or, or expenses because they had no control in it? The system failure. So, to my understanding, the system failure is one of the one of the operational risks. So, it's the ops loss, right? Right. Even though, even though it does seem like it's sort of in the course of a uh, normal course of doing business, it really was a systems failure of some type. You have somebody who's head of operations, and you have another person who's sort of the head of the business. The head of the business wants to ex put that expense in ops losses because any expense in ops losses, the business manager can turn around and point the finger at somebody else. Okay. And that happens all the time because lots of times operations doesn't report to the business managers. Often they do not report to the business managers because they want a degree of independence between the back office and the front office. So the front office where the business manager is and all the other C-suite people try to take as many expenses as they can and stick them in the ops loss bucket, bucket so that they can point fingers at somebody else. Yeah, our expenses went up a million dollars this quarter, but it was really because of a mistake that they made in operations. Right, as opposed to, yeah, our expenses went up a million dollars in a quarter um, because we spent more on advertising. Right. Um, sometimes it's easier just to lay it, lay off the responsibility to somebody else. It's not cool, but that's what front office people do a lot of the time. Anything else? No, thank you. Okay. I have a question, Professor. Go ahead. So you, you want to confirm that any any activities that is not related to the core business of the company, um, the expenses are um, classified as the apps expenses. That's right, right? Let's go back to the definition. The enhanced definition, okay, let's try to rely on it literally. Operation risk is the risk of loss resulting from inadequate or failed internal processes. People, the human factor, systems, or from external events. Do you all know what I mean when I say something is subjective as opposed to objective? There's, there's a lot of subjectivity about whether something is an ops loss and, and recorded financially as an ops loss. But uh, I'm sorry, Mr. NASA? It's easier for me to say that. Yeah, um, yeah. Does that answer your question if we use that definition? Yes, just for the definition on the video, on the PowerPoint, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We're back with prisoner 61727054. I think this might mean a little more to you this week after having done the reading. Once we finish it all, maybe. I, I didn't hear that way. Once we finish all the readings, probably. I think if you get into the first chapter or two, you get a pretty sense of this guy burning. Um, remember that you know, it can be a little complicated because he had three lines of businesses. And so I don't wanna make this 
more difficult for people who don't have a lot of stock and bond trading experience. So we're going to take the market maker out of the picture here. Some of you will have a better idea of what that is than others of you. So it's really not fair for us to spend a lot of time on market makers. And you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really part of the fraud anyway, so we don't need to. Something else we don't need to look at, the sort of the second of his three businesses were investments that BLMS were making for their own account. You know, they had their own balance sheet. Basically, they had their own wallet that they were making investments in. But we're talking about here the third one, the investment advisor, the farthest thing from legitimate. Okay, this is where Bernie made investments or was supposed to have been making investments on behalf of clients' accounts. They give Bernie the money and he makes investments with it and then gives them the proceeds. They're either stacking up big gains that they never tap into, or, or they go in and they get a distribution of some of their cash. But one thing that we do know is that Bernie was never making any investments and he wasn't generating any cash that way. The only way he was generating cash was from new investors giving him checks. Okay, um, oftentimes when I'm doing a, uh, thinking about not just sort of a case, a case study, but something that just happens in the normal course of business, the way I like to think about it is the way that a journalist thinks about a story or the journalist is supposed to think about a story or a case or whatever when they first start looking at it. And what I mean by that is it's good to answer the questions are who did what, who, what, when, where, and why. Um, also sometimes who, what, where, why, and how. So let's, let's go through this again. Let's put them in, in the perspective of Bernie Madoff. You have who, the answer to that question. What is the second question? What did Bernie do? Third question is where? Fourth question would be why did Bernie did this? And the fifth question would be how did Bernie do this? Okay, by methodically going through all those, it's pretty comprehensive and you won't miss a lot if you do it that way. If you painstakingly go through the who, what, when, where, why, and how analysis. So in the Madoff case, let's answer some of those questions so we know how this works. Okay, let's answer the who question for Madoff. Who are we talking about? Financial advisor, investor. Okay, let's start off with Daria. Are you there? Unmute? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, who's involved in the Bernie uh, situation? Who are some of the people? Okay, well we have, obviously we have Bernie himself and we have Bernie, um, Madoff, Bernie Madoff Securities. That's okay, it'll come easier next time after we practice these. Other people who were involved would be a compliance team uh, other people would be financial uh, and accounting auditors. Another uh, group that would be involved would be the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, another group that would be involved are bank and securities regulators. So we have the who's in the Madoff case. We have Bernie, his company, investors, some of his support teams, compliance, financial, and uh, you got the Internal Revenue Service and bank and securities regulators. Who else? Who else? Somebody give me a wave. His sons. Huh? I mean, the son, the family. Yeah, we could count them. We could, we could count the sons.
Vivek, are you about to say something? No. Uh, is the IA count, Professor? I was going to say the SEC, but I think you mentioned that already. Right. So, you know, just sit, sit back and think about this for a second. Investing, who all gets involved in an investment, an investment fund? Investment bankers, I would say. Yeah, they're, they're, Bernie was almost an investment bank. Um, where, where investment banks would, would get into the picture is he could be buying securities from them, which he never did, or the investment bank could be buying securities from Bernie Madoff himself, which didn't happen very often. Bernie sold his shares to, not to businesses, he, told, he sold them to his affinity group, a lot of a lot of Jewish philanthropy organizations. Um, so who else? Who else can we think of? People as investors. What's that, Sophia? What? Just people, investors, the rich people. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, investors. Yeah, we we name the investors. Um, but my point in all this is not to torture you. <laughs> My point is, is that there are a lot of people involved in the who when it comes to Bernie Madoff, a lot of people involved. And you know, for the life of me, I don't know, were they blind, were they deaf? But the investors, they didn't know what was going on. Bernie's company didn't seem to know what was going on on the 17th floor. Compliance team, I'm not even sure he had one. You know, he had his his niece or somebody, his his brother and and the brother's daughter, his niece, were the compliance team. They're they're supposed to be independent. Um, financial and accounting auditors. You're going to find out if you hadn't if you haven't found out already. You're going to find out in that book that Bernie's accountants. Are you ready for this, Bernie's accountants? was basically a one or two man shot, shop someplace out in the burbs. It, uh, uh, it, it looked like they were uh, uh, an accounting firm that did people's taxes, you know, did their 1040 EZ taxes. Um, then there's always the Internal Revenue Service, which he needs to be reporting on behalf of uh, not just the company, but on investors themselves, uh, gains and losses. And then there's all the banks and security regulators that were involved. All these people missed it, missed it, missed it, missed it. So remember who, what, when, where, and why, and how. The who are a big collection of people that were asleep or didn't want to know what was going on. In many cases, that was it. They just didn't want to know what was going on. Um, Okay. All right. Who are these guys? Andrew and Mark. Nice. They look like a couple of nice guys. I saw his sons. Are they his sons? Mm -hmm. okay. Those are the sons. Don't you see a resemblance, a family resemblance? Yeah. Well, I don't see so much of one. I guess in the guy in the Nose middle. Nose and the eyes. So. The question is, is it plausible? Now, there's, there's a you know, difference between plausible and possible. You know, it's, uh, it's possible that they didn't know what was happening on the 17th floor. Question is, was it plausible? You know, it's possible that a pig could fly, but it's possible that it could, but it's not very plausible. We don't expect it. So is it plausible 
that they didn't that they didn't know what was happening on the 17th floor. Oh uh, yes, because I think. Uh, Who said that? Let me, let me find uh, you. Can Who only. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, because I think they don't even have the key or the access into the 17th floors. So I think the main secret is hold by Menhoff. Like, yeah, they don't have the access into the 17th floors. They might know there's something might happening, but I don't think they are going to reveal or something. Anybody else have any other thoughts? I think I might say that because how will you not question it if you don't even have access and you're supposed to be working closely with your father? Like, what is he hiding? Do you ever question it? Is the good question. Or maybe they had access and just say that they didn't to save face, just to say they weren't aware when in actuality they might have. Well, there's the plausibility. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There might be, oh, uh, well, I was just guessing, right? Maybe like the employees or anybody knows about it, but just like they don't want to be the whistleblowers because, you know, since if these things happen, they're going to lose their jobs. You know, it's it's possible. Claire, did you want to add something? Get a benefit from being a whistleblower. Like I thought anyone that like blew the whistle usually gets like paid out. So it's good to be a whistleblower or there's benefits to it. But if it's yeah, done, then, so they might not. And, <laughs> But I, I, I don't know. But I mean, I think probably they knew something like, I think either they knew something sketchy was going on or he had hired people that were so uneducated in like the whole process that they just did what they were told and they didn't understand that this is not how any of this works. Like that's probably what happened. Like everyone was so, like dumb's the wrong word, but just were so not, in the industry that they didn't realize this is like absolutely insane and not how it works. Well, Claire, have you got to a point in the book, I'm not sure it's in the first few chapters where they talk, it might be later, but have you reached a point where they talk about who Bernie liked to hire? Last class that they that they hired like near college, near high school dropout. So. <laughs> that's right. I just, so, I just, I just copied you from last week, honestly. <laughs> that's okay, that's fine. Glad somebody was listening. Uh, uh, I, I, I find it hard to believe that they didn't know what was going on. Um, you know, like what Desiree said, at a minimum, they knew that something was going on there that their dad didn't want them to know about. And that should be asked, they should be as, asking a lot of questions about that. Uh, uh, they, they never got indicted or prosecuted. So it definitely is possible and maybe even a little plausible. They, you know, all the regulators, everybody. Salman, what do you think? Um, I actually think it's plausible that they didn't know what was going on uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, if you, one of the things I remember, uh, he was going to turn himself in on December 27th after he defaulted, right? He, he told them on December 10th, apparently he told them on December 10th. And as soon as the sons found out, they're the ones who turned him in. So right. he didn't turn himself in. They turned him in. Right. I thought that was big. And also- They had to say face though. Yeah, the cops turned him in because they didn't want to be in trouble. Exactly. Oh. They did that to save their own self. <laughs> possibly possibly um but also like uh he they they were running a a, a market maker plate a business up on the 19th floor that was entirely different from the 17th floor right they, they were running a business that was worth uh, at its peak up to three billion dollars um and pro they probably knew that your, his their dad was doing something dirty but they didn't know what that was and it was an entirely separate business so did they know enough to say uh, this is what my dad is running a Ponzi scheme? I don't think so. I think he, they did. I think they did. And even though they were running separate businesses, they were smart enough to know something is going on in the 17th floor, but they didn't want to turn their father in until they caught up to him. And then they flipped because they didn't want to get in trouble themselves. 
but they didn't want to be the whistleblower until it was to the point where they couldn't cover it anymore. Right. I think you should ever like assume that people are smart because people will like shock you with how not <laughs> smart they are. No, like if you don't know these things, why would you know? You know what I mean? Like if they didn't know that this is how it works, why would they? Like, well, I don't know. I don't think they you should ever give people they, credit. They how would I think? How could they not what know? I, it's his son. What I think they is, if the other they, workers didn't know, his sons knew. No, but they pretended that so the 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 father helped what if they were running this other business the father helped them so in a way they still dependent on him so somehow it to me seems that's why they didn't want to turn him in no but i think to a point where as you said they're saving themselves but they should probably know it's like there's no way yeah (laughs) no way is a strong no way is a strong way to put it yeah, I feel like at those levels, I, I at a firm or a business, you know what's going on mm-hmm. almost everywhere at those higher levels. I, the financials, you're seeing these, and I don't know, as uh, even if you're on a separate floor, and especially it's your father, there had to be, at the very least, some reasonable doubt. Yeah. 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 Um... It's tragic, unfortunately, we'll never know for sure, or at least you and I won't. Um, One son died of cancer and the other committed suicide over this. But uh, I I know that they weren't indicted. They are certainly never convicted of anything. They weren't even indicted. So um, there must have been some feeling like it's plausible they didn't know what was going on. or they could have gotten take him a down. waiver. No, but they could have gotten a waiver when they sent yeah. him in. They could have agreed into that statement that listen, I'm I'm doing this, but I need to save myself. Like they yep. some of the deal. You know? Yeah, deal type of thing. So that's how well, they <laughs> didn't didn't Bernie tell them to turn turn him in? Or did they just go do that on their own? Just call the lawyer on their own. They, I they never, cl- they never that clarified too. that. They never clarified that in the book. I'm not sure if it, if anyone knows from like outside the book. Yeah. But it's, it's but talking about that, well, it's a family, right? And you have to think like, they, I think they all knew what's going on. Even the father and the kids, they all knew everything. They planned it. They planned from the beginning. And then it's like, if anything happened, this is all you guys can get off from it dad will take the fall he's older yeah. Yeah. and let the sons live exactly take the fourth on the father and then the kids can come out mm-hmm. well this isn't as important but as a curiosity who thinks the wife knew she knew something was up yeah is that, I, I think those are two different things in terms of like yeah. knowing something is up but it benefits you to not ask any questions versus knowing Okay, my husband's running an actual Ponzi scheme. The son knew no, more no. than the wife did to the extent <laughs> of it because they worked there. So the sons knew a little more than the wife did. The wife had an idea something is off. The sons knew something was wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a quick question. Do you, and this might... Might- uh, turn the class off into a tangent, but do you believe that if both sons were alive, they would be indicted? I don't know. I mean, I think that there was probably enough time to indict them before their untimely deaths. I, I just don't know. I, if, if I were the investigator, I would assume that they knew. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I don't know if that's enough to convince a grand jury that somebody should be indicted. I mean, not, I think they would get enough evidence to find out who was all involved. Maybe they needed them to, to tie the case with a bow. So that's why they probably weren't indicted as well. Wasn't this all around the time that on Wall Street there were the protests, or is that way after? Oh, um, 2008, close to the crisis, the financial crisis. Are you talking about yeah. the timing? They took over that park next to the, down there where the Trade Center is. I don't remember if that was 2012 or 2008. If it was 2008, 
then it's directly related to this. That's when that's when Bernie uh, went down. I don't remember exactly. I I, I just don't know. Uh, what was the name of that that movement? Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street. Can somebody Google that right now and find it out was, when? It, it was September seventeenth, twenty eleven. Okay. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. My uh, one of my sons was down there protesting. Basically, protesting against me. <laughs> That's you know the old expression. Now I know why lions eat their young. <laughs> okay, so much for the who's. Uh, what about the what's? Okay, what was involved in the Madoff case? Just at a high Ponzi level. Ponzi scheme. Ponzi scheme, securities fraud. There is also wire fraud, mail fraud, and money laundering. I don't want you to spend any time on those things. Just spend all of your time on the securities fraud, the Ponzi scheme. Okay, uh, <laughs> it's 10 to seven and we've just got basically through the review of last week. Uh, I'll see what I can cut out of here. Today, we're gonna go over a lot of the risk government, uh, governance, uh, sort of the apparatus or organization that you set up to manage operational risk and other kinds of risk. Um, and then I'll skip that slide. I'm gonna give you another case study here from my checkered past. Okay, I was involved with a program at Citibank called Credit Protector. I actually ran it. Um, and what it was is it was something that customers for our, our bank card customers could enroll in the program pay the fee, and then uh, the program would um, make the payment for you if you were unemployed, if you were sick and you could document it, or if there was a natural disaster, okay? So you pay your fee every month, you lose your job, and then you don't have to make your credit card payment. So, you know, you could think of the fee as insurance. The way it was marketed was confusing. I felt like it was a little underhanded. Um, we went with it because it was the industry standard where they would say, you know, it's 85 cents per hundred dollars of balance. Um, but what that works out to is you had a typical credit card interest rate of about 12%. And 85 cents per 100 times 12 months is another 10%. So for the program, if you looked at it on an annual basis, it almost doubled the rate, okay, to get this kind of protection. Do you really feel like this is something that you're ever going to use? Okay. Now, job loss. I, I'm out of the program now. I don't work for Citibank anymore. But job loss. Would the pandemic have covered that? Or would the job loss have covered the pandemic? Well, depends what they depends what they mean by job loss. Like, because sometimes they can be tricky about what kind of job loss is. If like the job is literally, you know, like pandemic or because you got fired or because of, they can be precautions on place that they might not want to pay out. Yeah, but as a practical matter, the, um, the losses, the expenses 
that we had to pay for benefits to people associated with this product were not very high. There weren't a lot of people making claims. So if there was a, uh, a claim because of job loss, we didn't look very far into it. You don't wanna have a program out there that you're charging people for and nobody's using it, right? Mm -hmm. So I haven't asked anybody, but my guess is for COVID, people would get the job loss benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's sickness. You know, you, you need a note from the doctor. Now, COVID would be perfect for that, mm -hmm. right? For all of them. <laughs> It's, yeah, COVID, it, it, it seems like everything that happened there uh, would have made you eligible for credit protector, right? Uh, what about uh, the storm last night? Oh, natural disaster. That's right. You could make the case that, okay, I can't go to work or my business that I work at is flooded and it's going to be closed uh, for I don't know how long. You could make a claim there. Well, the, the insurance company sent out emails today. This is where you can put your claim in case anything happened from the storm. <laughs> so I guess the expected. Are, are you saying, did you get that? Yeah, I got, well, I got an email where it says you can put your claim because if you something happened to your car from the storm, yeah. And what bank is that with? Oh, no, not the bank, it's just the insurance companies. Like oh, the insurance purchases. companies? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Not I don't have such a um, Interesting. When, so were people purchasing this? Were people purchasing it? Mm -hmm. We had hundreds of thousands of customers. Mm. And after expenses, it made... $330 million a year. Wow. And we looked at it one time and I ran the business and we figured out that it put me in like the fortune 250 or something <laughs> in terms of the amount of money that we were making just off this one product. You know, that's how big city cards is. And one piece of city cards was when- Was it because people were not explained properly? <laughs> because it could sound like a scam. <laughs> I think that it was complicated for people to understand. Right. Um, we uh, solicited them several ways um, over the phone telesales. And telesales, there's not as much telesales now as there was then. But to ensure that somebody was home, you know, we used to call them at six or seven o'clock when they were trying to eat, when they were trying to eat dinner, okay? So it was, it was difficult for the customers to focus on it. And it's a, it's a, you know, I explained it to everybody now in a much more succinct and clear way than we would explain it to our customers because there, there was a lot of fine print in the product, that won't uh, that won't surprise you. Um, the attorneys at Citibank uh, insisted on the fine print being read out aloud to the customers before they said, "Yes, I want to buy it." So we lost a lot of customers that way because going through the fine print and somebody sitting there and their steak is getting cold, they just say, forget it and hang up. Okay. Uh, but you know, even if you could focus on it, 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 it uh, you know, it was complicated. And I, and I can tell you that uh, I don't know who focused on that part. The people that work for me didn't even focus on that. I don't think they understood that. Okay. Now let's talk about Hurricane Katrina, which um, you know, has been in the news a lot lately because that was the big one before this last one. What was the last hurricane called? Ida? Katrina was the yeah. big one before Ida. No, her, her, um... Is it Irene? 
Irene? Was it Irene? It was another one. I don't remember. Irene's my mother's name. There are too, too many. <laughs> well, there was a big one okay. after that. Okay. As a result of the hurricane, there were major job losses. Uh, but few benefits were actually activated by the customers. We had very few people call up and say, because uh, let me back up for a second. This program didn't work automatically. You needed to call up when you lost your job. You know, obviously, uh, even if there was a natural disaster, you needed to call up and explain what the situation was. So back to Katrina, Katrina there were major job losses, but few people activated the benefits. Very few people. Um, I'll get this to go down. Okay. Now, why do you think that was that few people activated the benefits? And I'm telling you this, I'm, I'll give you a hint. It's an operations loss. They were not properly informed of the process, like the number maybe. Desiree, you took a shot. That was good, but it's not the right answer. <laughs> Anybody else want to take a Cause, shot here? Because when so you that they it, didn't have like cars or like phones. They, let's see, stop. Like they, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry, but like they literally couldn't, like this was not a priority for them. Oh my yeah. God, I'm sorry. Lexi, I'm going to kill you. Uh. Professor? Yeah. I had a credit protection on, on the loan. Loans have the same kind of protection except um, the sickness or something. Like if you lose a job or if, you know, if some, if the creditor dies, then you don't need to pay. Well, I simply forgot to use it when, you know, when the pandemic happened. So I could just call them, but I forgot. So that might be a case that people just pay the, because they pay very little, they just, you know, it's almost an invisible money that goes out of your packets. So they well, they, you know, they, you can make a claim in most cases for at least a year, sometimes even over a year. And, and that's by insurance regulations. It would depend on your kind of insurance. But anyway, you guessed it. There was a major flaw in the process. Let's talk about the categories of operational risk here for a good old credit protector. Okay, so what are we looking at? Credit protector is what kind of operational risk? Uh, let's see. Gianni Wang, you there? Um, yes. Okay. You want to take a shot at this? What kind of operational risk or risks are relevant to the credit protector program? And it's ops loss related to not being able to deliver the product to the customers. Um, business disruption, I guess. Business disruption and system failures. Yes. And uh... well, look, we're on the, the PL here, the profit and loss that, that is here is Citibanks. Okay, Citibank will have the operational risk. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have to. Uh, put the expenses somewhere on the income statement. Now, for Citibank, was it a business disruption and system failure? No. Uh, no. Yeah, not at all. I, I don't think so. I think it's execution and delivery. Uh, execution, delivery, and process management is the big one. Yeah. 
Um, no internal fraud, how about external fraud? It's not really relevant to this case. I'm sure that a lot of people made claims that weren't valid because of her, Hurricane Katrina. They just uh, threw theirs in knowing there'd be a lot of volume and it w our claims wouldn't be checked as closely. But uh, external fraud is not a big one here. Employment practices and workplace safety, nothing. Clients, products, and business practices. You know, I'm going to put a check mark on that one. Does anybody agree and have a reason for why they would say it falls in that bucket too? Credit protector? No business practice. It's like related to that too, meaning. Um, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Because it's like. It's technically a product, but then it's kind of feed it into how you know, the entire, it's related to like the, the credit card itself. Like if they wouldn't have that credit card, they wouldn't have that insurance protector thing on it. So it's like. I would put it in that bucket because I think the product itself is too complicated. I think the product is too complicated for the customers. I think that sometimes they say yes, because they think the bank is telling them they must say yes, or they would lose their credit card. There's a lot of, uh, I think, confusion like that. Um, I think because of all the confusion, people say yes, and they forget that they even have it. Um, so I would throw it in that bucket too, products. Um, damage to physical assets, no, Citibank was okay. Business disruption and system failures? Nope. So we had the two, clients, products, and business practices, and execution, delivery, and process management. Anybody else think there should be something else going once? Going twice? Three times. Okay. So this is what we have for Credit Protector. Professor. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't hear you back. Like, I mean, I'll... My house was flooded last night, so I was busy, like, I mean, cleaning my house. Oh, sorry to hear that. Yeah, I, I can, yeah. So, kind of result. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. I back couldn't hear you. Like, what is, uh, what is the question? Like, I mean, I couldn't hear you. That's okay. Let's move on. Let's just move okay. on. I understand you got an issue there. Okay. Credit protector. The source of the operational risk, what do people think? Processes. Because the, the, just how convoluted it was. <laughs> like you know, it, it, uh, information? you know, I look at this chart and I could make a case for every single one of them. I mean, not an error, like it was intentionally built there. So I can Well, let's look at the people, okay? Everybody who thought that this was going to be a effective way of reminding people that they could activate their benefit got it wrong. It wasn't an effective way to do it. So a lot of money was spent to try to get people to activate their, their program. And it was just a waste of money. They didn't get the mail or they didn't get the call or they got it too late. So that would be, I think, how I would make the case for people. Now going next to it, process, the process that supports the activity is flawed. Well, that was certainly the case, sending mail out into a flooded zone. Now system, the system that facilitated the activity is broken. If you look at systems in terms of like IT, that kind of thing, 
then I, I guess it doesn't fall in that bucket. The external events that disrupts the activity, um, you know, that, that could be the, the hurricane itself that there was flooding and the flooding didn't go away. So what I came up with, and again, it's subjective. What I came up with was three out of the four. Anybody think that anything I identified shouldn't have been in there? Okay, I think, I think we're starting to get a sense of what is and what isn't an ops loss, that kind of thing. And we can move on to other cases. Right now it's 7.09, um, let's take a 10 minute break, come back at 11, let's come back at 7.20, okay? Okay.
Okay, we're back. Testing, can anybody hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, we can, yes, we can hear you. Okay, you can still hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay, now we're going to talk about risk governance. And this is kind of the overall. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried because I had those headphones there and I took them off. Uh, governance relates to the overall company wide enterprise risk function that looks at all the individual businesses, units, uh, opines on their risk management structure, environment, and tries to coordinate the risk environments between all the different businesses. Uh, when we say risk here, we're gonna be speaking specifically about operations risk. Remember that uh, Credit risk is the risk that somebody defaults on a loan. Uh, market risk is the risk that your investments move against you or you spend a lot on an advertising campaign that doesn't work out. Those are, uh, those are costs in the normal course of doing business. Operational risk is everywhere in a company and involves everybody in the organization. The risk governance framework should encompass everybody. Without strong operational risk management, a firm might be exposed to huge risk. Governance determines roles and responsibilities. Um, and and uh, of the head of the operational risk function and also his or her team that manages, oversees and encounters the uh, framework. Good government governance is the starting point for good operational risk management. Um, given that risk management is vitally important to all firms, good operational risk management should be one of the board's primary aims and responsibilities. Um, it's more and more so. Did I hear a question? Uh, yes, are you sharing the screen of slides? Because I only see you. No, I wasn't. I was I was keeping it to myself. I wanted to be able to look at your faces, but most of the time I'm not seeing you anyway. Um when I first uh, started working at Citibank, I told you a little bit about this story. I was working, I, I went to work in the mortgage business and our credit policy was so bad that we had losses all over the place. And we had a very, very weak operations risk management framework. It was good on the credit side, but for operations, it was terrible. Um, the analysis that, that we did across the business was not uniform. Um, cross business, cross functional impacts weren't identified. Um, so as the regulators were coming in and helping us to clean up the mortgage business, and a lot of that was on the credit and the marketing side, they still demanded, uh, demanded a, a reorg within the operations risk management area. And they started demanding uh, a lot of what we call stress tests. And stress tests is just another way of saying what if analysis. You make a bunch of scenarios and you look at what would happen to your organization. In the uh, mortgage case, it was uh, what happens if interest rates go up, down, you know, all sorts of scenarios like that. And you would play them out 
and you would have a scenario and you would quantify that and show that to the company so that we could manage around it, but also show it to the regulators. And as an example of that, what happens when interest rates go up on the mortgage business? Well, you don't have people refinancing their mortgages because uh, the rates are high. So that takes down some volume. Uh, rates are high. So you have more defaults. You have more people that can't pay for their loan. So you have to staff up for that in your collections area. Not staffing up for that in your collection area could be a borderline ops loss risk. Uh, then we had you know, scenarios for low interest rates. Low interest rates, you would have uh, a lot more sales because you would need people to talk to all the customers that wanted to refinance their mortgage into a lower rate. Um, but on the other hand, with lower interest rates, you'd have people making a lower monthly payment. So there was lower, fewer delinquencies and lower losses, credit losses. I'm telling you all this so that, you know, you could see that we didn't have a comprehensive overall risk management framework. Once we did the stress test, we did. And it made it um, a lot more transparent for us to anal analyze what happens, what are the dominoes? If, if rates go up, if rates go down, if there's a recession, if there's a natural disaster, doing, having all the stress tests uh, gave us sort of a playbook to use. And that was driven down ultimately to all the other organizations. We did it first in the mortgage business, but at the same time, the bank created a higher operations risk function to oversee all the businesses. And that higher governance area adopted our stress tests. So then they pushed those down into your organization that every business unit needed to do stress tests like we had done in the mortgage business. And that's, that's an example of you know, the risk governance that we reported that to a risk management team that was above us. They considered it, they opined on it, and they liked it so much that they drove it down in the organization and made things consistent. Um, we're gonna talk now about the three lines of defense that there are um, against operations risk management. And the first one is that, uh, that the governance needs to be on the lookout for is uh, you need to have somebody who manages and owns the risk, okay? That's, that's one thing. Second thing is you need someone who oversees the risks and designs risk management functions for the business units or the business lines, product lines. That's what we were just talking about. Some group, the governance, governance that oversees what the people who manage the risk are doing. The people who manage the risk are the boots on the ground. They're the people on the floor. They're managing the risk. But number two are the people that oversee that. They evaluate the processes. They determine whether they're adequate or they may determine that it's overkill. Um, there's a typo here. And the next one is design reviews that provide independent assurance. So, you know, that could be independent auditors coming in that could be from even outside the bank to come in to look to see that the governance is working and the three lines of defense are, are working. So let's, let's take a look at the first line of defense. Um, Um, on on uh, just a question while we find that. So basically when this was proposed to other organizations besides the ones you were, um, then is this 
independent auditor that they had to come in and kind of see what's going on and then build controls around it? Or like, how did that work? They to did. make sure it's actually functioning and this not being anything sketchy. Yeah, I, I hesitate for a second uh, because there's a sort of a, a, a cynical answer that I could give you that's, that's just part, of, it'll be part of the answer. The outside auditors found things that we missed. It's their job. They, they look at you know, risk management frameworks over and over all day long. But that's not why we hired them. This is the cynical part. The reason- well, we More I thought to teach you guys how to do that because you can get exp expertise while they find errors. <laughs> you know, these companies, these banks are filled with hubris. Hubris they don't think that anybody knows could possibly know any more than they do. I'll that's totally wrong, but that's their attitude. The, the cynical second reason that I'll give you is that people in the business, myself included, like to be able to say, okay, we re-engineered the whole process. We have an operational risk management framework now. And we called in outside auditors and they said it was okay. So if you don't think it's okay, take it up with them. That's the second reason so that people can hide behind experts. Oh, I see. Yeah. I didn't want to have to give you that answer. But. That's tricky. Oh, well, whenever I'm asked at work and I'm asking people for things, they're like, who's asking? I said, auditors. So they send me stuff. <laughs> so you, you have the business line and that could be somebody running credit protector. And within the business line, hopefully you have risk people, compliance people, finance people, and other people that would be looking at the risks. And then you have an internal audit function, hopefully that looks at what the business line is doing. We're gonna talk about another case study now. Okay, this is the case about somebody by the name of Nick Leeson. And he pronounced it Leeson, but it could almost be Lesson. That's my humor for this evening. Um, and this is back in 1995. And Nick was a trader um, at Barings Bank one of the biggest banks internationally at the time in 1995. And he was making trades, Nick was, on behalf of the bank and, and on behalf of clients. So he was not brand new, but he didn't have a ton of experience. And he made a trade one night that really, count, uh, how should I say it? The trade counted on there being very little movement in the Japanese stock market. That was part of his hedge. But he made the, he made the investment. He would ride through the night and then unmake it the next day. Uh, however, the Kobe, Kobe earthquake hit early in the next morning, sending Asian markets into a turmoil and Leeson's trailing, uh, trading positions into a tailspin. Okay. This, this sounds like it's a, uh, an external event type of thing, this Kobe earthquake. But Nick, for whatever reason, decided that the trade he made wasn't a very good trade. It wasn't a smart trade. <clears throat> so what he did is he generated an illegal account. And the number of the account was 88888. Anybody know why he would pick that number? 
I'm thinking like the phone lines. I don't know. I think eight is a very lucky number in the Chinese culture, isn't it? No? Mm -hmm. That's what people said at the time. So he picked that as his uh, trade account to sort of hide the losses. Okay, so we looked at that and we thought, well, five minutes ago, we thought, well, that's an external event, okay? But now what do we think it was? We have this guy who's hiding the losses so that he can still get his big bonus at holiday time. So what does that seem like? What kind of ops loss source? Internal fraud. Fraud. We have another case of fraud. Um, and the problem was uh, there was really no effective supervision of Nick. He was on the floor doing his own trading, doing his own compliance, his own uh, accounting, his own auditing, he did everything on the floor. And there wasn't a separation of responsibilities. So Nick could basically do whatever he wanted. He made an account and just hit his losses in it. Um, you need to be able to, and this didn't happen at Bering, supervise the employees with, with compliance and procedures, regularly review cash shortages and report instances where an explanation might be unsatisfactory. He wasn't really reporting a lot of cash basis results. And he was constantly going back to bearings and saying that he needed more and more cash for more and more investments. And nobody asked the questions like, well, Nick, aren't you selling securities all the time in addition to buying them? Shouldn't you be getting some cash from that? Why is it that you're always coming back to us for more cash? Does it cash thing goes through the, it goes through through different three, four people usually to approve cash to leave. <laughs> Not at this place. Everything. Not at this place. The next bullet that I have is that, you know, you need supervisors to check receipts and responsibilities and documentation. Um, and people need to challenge suspicious transactions. And that wasn't happening in Nick's case. And Nick's, um, case had some similarities with Bernie's and that really there was, no, there was nobody supervising either one of these guys. And um, they didn't like to lose. Neither of these guys, Nick or uh, Bernie wanted to lose. So both of them continued to just fraud their way through it for years and years and years. Nick, not so long, but uh, Again, it was just a question of he didn't want to own up to losses. Um, each business line should have their own set of risk management people. There should be operational risk managers in operations, technology, finance, legal, compliance, and human resources, as well as any other front office businesses like fixed income, equities, retail banking, corporate banking, and so on. Everybody needs a risk management staff. Otherwise, you're going to have people like Nick creating 888888 and hiding all the losses and having no structure in place for anybody to audit them. Okay, so I think we decided. Okay, I think we decided the category of operational risk here is, oh wait a minute, I don't, what do we call it? Internal fraud. Internal fraud for Nick. Any external fraud that we can see? Um, yeah. Fact that was not called up from any type of outside reporting. I don't know. Um, I don't see external fraud as being a big case, big problem here. 
certainly saw internal fraud. Employment practices and workplace safety. Well, you know, employment practices are a lot about, are you hiring a diverse group? That kind of thing. Um, are you discriminating against people over the age of 55? Something like that. Does that sound relevant to this? Mm -hmm. Age 50, how do we know that what was his age? <laughs> well, how do you know how old Nick was? <laughs> Nick, Nick was young. Uh, clients, products, and business practices. I mean, it is because in a way it's like handling a bank that's like a company. I don't know. I think you have to I say think maybe the maybe the business practices because they didn't have that uh, that risk manager that you had mentioned. Exactly. Business practices is one. We've got internal fraud, we've got business could, practices. Could be between the business practices and process management, because they kind of like yeah. I don't know. Deliver execution. That's some similarity. Yeah. Damage to physical assets. Don't see that in this case. No, not there. Business disruptions and system failures. I see as a what I call a system failure is the fact that everything was going so smoothly and no <laughs> means the system was broken somewhere. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I have to make this clear really clear, I'm going to put this in the notes, but for the purposes of this class, we're going to call systems. I can hear you very well. For the purposes of this class, we're going to call systems IT systems. So when we IT have systems. systems, OK, so that's the IT thing, OK. So now the last one we have here is execution, delivery, and process management. Uh, it sounds like. Yeah. So we have three things here. We have internal fraud, clients, products, and business practices, execution, delivery, and process management. Okay. Um, Moving on. Source of the risk. People. People. Yes. Relevant. People. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you got Nick. <laughs> you got, uh, how about the process? Obviously. Yes. Systems, now we're going to call that IT, so we're going to say that's no. Mm -hmm. External events. Mm, the earthquake? I got to say the earthquake. You know, somebody, somebody could say, uh, somebody could let accounting get, get away with that and call his losses, ops losses, because there was an unforeseen earthquake. But, you know, there's unforeseen COVID uh, pandemics too. And people didn't shove all their expenses related to that into there. So, you know, it's again, it's subjective. If somebody said external events, I'd say, okay. If somebody didn't say external events, I'd say, okay, with that too. Okay, so mainly that was about the people on the ground in the business, their risk functions, and Nick and his risk function. The second line of defense is the corporate operational risk function. Okay. Okay. Um, They were responsible for two things. The organizational risk people that are at the top of the enterprise, they're responsible for the development of the operational risk framework and reporting on operational risk management to the firm's senior management and board of directors. So I was in, I was in a business unit one time. I was the director of credit policy for the student loan business at Citibank. Okay, so we would do all of our on the floor, risk business practices, everything related to the, to the business. And then I would make presentations upstream to the risk management senior uh, managers 
And that's what they would do. Uh, they would turn around and report on anything that I reported on, if it was important, to the directors. And it was board of directors for the company. So it was all combing up the risk line. Um, they, uh, their responsibility is to set up the risk committees. Their responsibility, the second line of defense, is to challenge the first line's inputs to and inputs from the bank's risk management and reporting systems. You know, somebody should challenge me and say, are you really reporting all your losses? Are you recording them in the right place? What is it that you're doing instead of just this reporting? What is it that you're doing to try to protect the company from these losses? These are all the kind of questions I would get for my matrix from my matrix bosses above me in uh, credit policy. If, uh, if it's working the way it should be, the, the higher level enterprise-wide risk management function should be providing insights into risks, even to the business level people. Because at their high level, this higher organization has a vantage point where they can see what's happening throughout the organization. And they can see beyond the organization and they can see risks that are evolving even beyond the organization better than the people who are focused on her, their own business day in and day out. And, and they, can keep, uh, they can keep ahead of emerging risk trends too. So you get these people that sort of are out of the day-to-day -day ups and downs, 24-7 uh, uh, issues that you have with dealing with the business. And you have this second line that's only dealing with risk in your business and other people's business. Um, Back to Nick, uh, he didn't have anybody above him who was really checking his trades. Uh, Nick was allowed to place orders on his own without any supervision. And at the same time, uh, and you're not gonna believe this, Prandera, he was uh, supervised all the accounting and all the settlements at the same time. <laughs> okay. You think there's any pro problem here from a risk management perspective? Anybody? I well, I'm speaking from a point of view where I served, like I, I did the role as middle office for some time, and in terms of the whole risk, I mean, I had to verify what the people are doing from both ends. <laughs> um, so it was the middle man. So I don't know how he's just doing it all like that. Definitely no supervision. Um, Which is not about, first of all. With Nick, the problem was is that he had a conflict of interest. Right. He was really looking out for himself more than he was looking out for the bank. Uh, here's a quote by Nick. I had one foot on the dealing floor, but I was also in charge of the girls in the back office who would carry out any of my requests. I could see the whole picture, it was easy. I was probably the only person in the world to be able to operate on both sides of the balance sheet. It became an addiction, unquote. Uh, the, the solution here is you, know, you can't just fire Nick. You need an overarching risk management function that works with him and audits him. You can't have these sales and trader people out there on their own. They'll do whatever they have to do to maximize their bonus, even if that means hiding their losses. A risk uh, governance structure must support the independence of the operation risk function. You can't be a captive. If you're a head of operations risk, you can't be a captive of what the business manager says, right? You have to have some independence. If the business manager says, what you wanna put in place, Mr. Risk Manager, is too expensive. I don't want it, I don't think we need it. That's why you need the independence in the operation risk function. It's the same with finance and accounting. You have a business manager, but you have a lot of people that report to the business manager, but they usually report at the same time to somebody in their function. Like I reported to the head of the student loan business, but at the same time, I also reported to the head of credit risk management for the bank. 
So if I had a problem with my, uh, my business manager, I could go to the other guy or vice versa. But what's important is that uh, they're independent. The risk management feature, uh, function is independent. Um, I have some chart here, charts that show the types of organizational structures. I'll leave that to you when you go through the notes. They're in the there are notes that I'm going to give you. Um, so what, what should the chief risk officers and their teams, what could they do? Uh, they have the ability to influence decisions that affect the bank's exposure to risk. The chief risk officer can push back at times and may demand, demand uh, more risks to be put in place. And they can engage with the board and other senior management on key risk issues. So they have a door open to senior management. Um, what are the three things that a risk committee should do? One is to create some structure, to utilize a board created enterprise level committee for overseeing all risk to which a management level operational, operational risk committee reports. Now, remember in the mortgage business, I was doing credit and risk there and I just had nobody above me. The only person I reported to was the business manager. But at that point, there was, it really wasn't an enterprise-wide or, or uh, operational risk function. Um, the committee should have uh, members with expertise in business activities and financial as well as independent risk management. So you need, you need people from all over the organization to sort of be guest people in the operation risk committees because the operation risk committee may not know a lot about marketing. So you need somebody in marketing when the risk committee is meeting. And they have, they have to meet you know, regularly uh, and have the adequate time and resources to per, permit a productive discussion. Records of committee operations should be adequate to permit review and evaluation of committee effectiveness. Okay, now the third line of defense we have here is internal audit. Um, an internal auditor's report issued after uh, the Nick Leeson problem stated that combining the dual responsibility of front and back office and Leeson's job was, quote, an excessive concentration of powers, unquote, which led, could lead to an abuse of control by Leeson, and it did. Uh, and here he is, the man, the legend himself. That's Nick being taken away by the uh, law enforcement officials in Singapore where they, ex they extradited him back to the UK. Looks but, proud. Huh? It looks like he's proud what he has done. You know, I'm really glad you said that. There was something about him that bothered me. And that's what it is, probably. He's got that expression. He certainly isn't showing any remorse. You know, in the end, he pretty much wiped out a lot of the stockholders of Barings Bank doesn't look like he cared too much. Now, this is the part that will really irritate you. He makes a business, he makes a, a living now as a lecturer talking about fraud. So uh, he teaches, he teaches how to fraud now. Exactly. And now, is that a loud thing now? That did he get like any, I don't know, like measurements on place of because he did something wrong, like what, any punishments? <laughs> well, I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure he did some time. Um, Teaching he, fraud. <laughs> yeah, he may not have, I, I don't know that for a fact, but at a minimum, he would have been stripped of all of his securities licenses. Oh, so now he has to make a living now, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's gotta make a living in some other dishonest way. And, and so, <laughs> 
you know, now he's running around teaching people how to uh, avoid or commit fraud and detect fraud. Mm. For those of you who want more information on fraud, I included just a little list here for your own amusement of some of the big frauds over the past 25 years. Looks like we can take one of his classes or something. <laughs> That's so crazy. Okay, and then internal audit, the third line of defense. Uh, it shouldn't be directly responsible for operation risk management. It should review and challenge what the business has done. The business are closer to the floor. They know more about the ins and outs of the business and an operations risk function above them. Um, but they still have the job of reviewing what they're doing in the business, and most importantly, please challenge what they're doing in the business. Okay. Uh, I have a question on this. Yeah. So you said when you implemented the, the whole like operational risk when, when you were working, how long did it take to implement it and have it functional? Like, like you know, it takes six months, it takes a year, a couple of months, like, when it's something new that hasn't been done before in your experience, how long did that take? It's a great question. Um, the complicating factor here in my answer is that we were really pressed by the regulators to get this done. Mm. And they gave us a time frame. They put a limit on it. I can't remember what the limit was, but have you ever heard the expression, uh, the expression work expands to fill the time. So uh, we didn't have a lot of time. And so we just did what we really had to do, the essence of what we had to do to appease the regulators and protect our stockholders. Now, over time, we built it out, but it was, uh, and it, it does take time to build these things out. You know, it could take a year or more. It's, it's, it should be people's first priority, but it's not. It's not directly generating any revenue. It doesn't rise to the level of people's first priority. Um, this is uh, a picture that just sort of depicts what we uh, had just been talking about, the first and the second and the third lines of defense. I've, I've marked it up a little bit because I want you to remember that the second line of defense is the company-wide risk management stuff. And the, the second line of defense can also go to the governing body, the big audit committee, the enterprise one. Okay, uh, a summary of least- in case, in case, Another question is, in case something fails on that chart, who is the blame the most? Now, that's a challenging question. Challenging. I don't know if I can answer that. That, that sounds like a cop-out, but should it be the people that made the mistake in the first line of the business? Well, they were supposed to be checked by the second line and the third line. Right. Uh, you know, uh, that was just a question, so I'm just... It could come down to personalities. Who do they want out of there? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so just to summarize, Nick, there was a lack of, for the front line, there was a lack of oversight and accountability, inadequate separations of responsibilities. That was the big one there. Second line, it was a siloed business. It wasn't like he was getting a lot of supervision from above. And uh, the third was, you know, there wasn't, wasn't much of an audit function and whatever they, they learned, they didn't really publicize it. Um, my boss, this is what came out in sort of the, the postmortem of what happened. My boss was not a very approachable person and it would even a little local colleague in front of others. Some prior employees lost their jobs due to a very small error. I didn't want this young lady who had only been with us for a couple of days to lose her job. 
You know, there's there are people covering for each other. Uh, you need to have a culture where both good news and bad news can flow freely. Auditors, uh, risk managers, they all have to be independent. And here's the best part, just like the Madoff story, there's a movie, there's a video that you can get released <laughs> about Nick Leeson, it's starring Ewan McGregor. You can get it out there on Amazon Prime. It's okay. It's, you know, if you've got, if you're looking for some entertainment and uh, you have a couple of hours to kill, I recommend it, but you can get by in the class. It's not gonna hurt you if you don't watch it. Okay. So at this point, it's eight o'clock. Let's take another 10 minutes and come back at 810. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, we're back. Okay. <clears throat> On the home stretch here. How many of you are in a different time zone than Eastern time? Raise your hand if you are. We don't have people in other countries dialing in. Is everybody back because they have classes now on campus? Nobody. Do, are you people taking classes on campus? No, it's right now. I mean, mine are all online. I think some people are back. So. I do take classes uh, in, in presence, like at the campus. Yeah. Well, what's better? A class like, say it's not six to nine. What's better? Is it in person or Zoom? I mean, the commute part is that it's not good because somebody can go home late, but I think I like the interaction in the classroom. Like, it would be nice. Yeah, I just don't think it should be from six to nine. That makes it kind of hard. Yeah, it's very hard. Be in the class. But if people work though. So, I mean, I work full time, so I can't do it any other time. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Okay, our next topic is going to be risk culture, risk appetite, and risk tolerance. And you may be surprised to find out that you will have some appetite for risk and that you will tolerate some risk. Okay. Definition of a risk culture. Okay, now I'm gonna read it to you. And for any of you grammar majors out there as undergrads, uh, in my opinion, what I read is a run on sentence, but uh, here it is. Rich uh, risk culture is the norms of behavior for individuals and groups within an, an organization that determine the collective ability to identify and understand and openly discuss and act on the organization's current and future risk. There's a lot in that. But I think the main thing about the risk culture that I would get from that long paragraph is the fact that you have to be able to openly discuss the risk, right? That's not always the case, but yes. It's not, it's not always the case. It's really not always the case. Uh, you know, bringing up risks are not the way to get a big bonus. I, no, you talk about it, then you're... <laughs> I, I, some, several of the jobs that I've had, uh, I was a CFO in the jobs. And you know, the opposite of a risk is an opportunity. And I would be there day after day, week after week, and nobody as the CFO, no one would ever bring me an opportunity. It, it was always a risk. Like you no, know, a CFO never has a good day. It's risk after risk after risk. But you need to be able to openly discuss them so you don't get surprised later. And I've been in organizations where they don't bring up risk. Somebody at the top may have a volatile personality and doesn't want to hear anything about risk. And that's exactly why the risk culture needs to provide for an independent group to monitor risk. Um, when, when you say speak about, are you saying that you see something that it's kind of like see something, say something kind of thing, like you're in your work process and then you bring it up that, hey, this is kind of like not the right way and then you just talk about it or? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it can be informal it, or it can be formal. It's just that we hope that people, they surface the risks or potential risks, right? And uh, the, the risk culture influences the behavior of each member in the organization a lot more than the processes, directives, management, and IT infrastructure will ever do. It's, it's, the, it's the attitude. If somebody has a, a risk culture that's strong and they have that uh, uh, attitude that it's something that is important to understand for any business, to identify, mitigate, and correct, 
then you don't have a good risk culture. If you have, uh, if you uh, reward people for identifying risks, give them a little extra in their bonus, then you have a good risk culture. And I've, uh, when I was at the bank or at another bank, I would reward the people if they brought me risks most of the time. A, a lot of times people would bring me risks that weren't gonna happen. A lot of times they would bring me risks that they brought it too late and you know the oncoming train ran us over. But do you, do you sort of understand what I mean about a risk culture in an organization? Uh, in recent years, more attention has been paid to the tone at the top uh, and the impact that these have on organizational uh, outcomes. And you'll see that over recent years, if, if you read company annual reports, they talk more and more about uh, their risk management function and how they poached a big uh, famous legendary risk manager from uh, American Express or some other place. And now the risk management function gets more of what it deserves in terms of uh, uh, respect and importance. Uh, back. Show you this slide. Okay. Professor, I have a question actually uh, about the risk culture. Yes. Uh, Professor, how, I mean, how do you, uh, like which company has like, I mean, the, like how do you determine which company needs the more like risk culture? Like, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's like risk culture, uh, risk culture is like important for like each uh, uh, companies like, like bank or any kind of like um, uh, credit, um, companies like I mean, how do you like uh, understand which company needs like more risk culture? And well, the cultures have a lot to do with the industry. Uh, something like a uh, oil well drilling operation is mostly about risk once they put the pipe in. Um, something like a bank can have a strong risk culture, or they could have a, a Liam Neeson, or not a Liam Neeson, a Nick Leeson uh, culture. You know, it, it, depends on the, uh, it depends on the industry, sector of the economy, company, and the people. It's hard to answer. This was, um, I, I looked for the source of this. I couldn't find it, it was two, two, 2017. Let's see if I can find it for next week, but my, this is a poll they took. My organization's performance management system is designed in, a, in alignment with my organization's risk appetite and encourages an appropriate level of risk taking in the pursuit of strategic objectives while maintaining accountability. So what's a good example of this? Um, a risk a a taking appetite. Let's talk about one related to lending. Somebody making loans, a bank making loans. And let's talk about the appropriate level of risk taking. If you have a hardcore risk manager, they may just say, don't do any business at all, then you won't have any risk. Okay, so in order to have any business at all in this lending operation, you need to, you need to have borrowers. And some of your borrowers are not gonna pay you back. And it's a risk that you knowingly get involved in. Uh, whereas in other cases, like Lit Nick, they were just taking uh, risks without there being a sort of, uh, a guideline 
for what is appropriate for a business to take a level of risk to be operating or what's inappropriate for a business. But anyway, in terms of people's bonuses and their compensation being aligned with risk management uh, priorities, 24% strongly disagreed with that. 33% disagreed with it. Neither agree or disagree it was 26. So what it comes down to is that only 17% of the people that were interviewed thought that their strategic objectives were aligned with the companies from a risk management standpoint. Only 17% of the people. And this is in 2017. What's a normal percentage in general? Because you're not going to get like 100% or we don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I'd like to get, I, I was looking for the data. I would love to get 18, 19, 20, but I don't, I can't find it. So hopefully I'll be able to get it. But 17% th saying that they are aligned personally with the risk management objectives of the company is pretty bad. Uh, but not all that unusual. Do, do people understand what I'm saying? Like you give, you, you give a person, an employee, an evaluation. And sometimes there's almost some checklist categories and a strong risk management orientation should be on the list, the checklist for giving a performance evaluation. Um, in some organizations I've worked in, it's almost the opposite. Uh, you know, you were penalized if you surfaced risks. So the 17% is a shockingly no, low, low number. And you, the banks incent salespeople all the time to make sales by giving them like 10% of the money as a commission. I don't see where people are getting commissions for uh, surfacing risk management issues. So that's why their uh, performance management isn't really aligned with the bank's risk management objectives. You still get a, get a bonus for pointing something like that out. So that's the 17% there that don't think that their personal performance and uh, evaluation is really aligned with the companies. Um, potential image, uh, issues with the risk culture could be overconfidence, uh, a culture where people believe that the organization is insulated or even immune from risk. Um, I don't think, uh, uh, does anybody think overconfidence played a part in Bernie Madoff's situation? It was a stupid confidence. It was too much confidence. I mean, that's not the right word, but I think. Yeah. I, I believe that he knew that the organization wasn't insulated from risk, but he just didn't care. And it, it goes back to the risk culture. You know, the, it, just, it just wasn't happening in the lipstick building, certainly not on the 17th floor. Okay, so the second component after overconfidence is that people don't challenge each other's attitudes, ideas, and actions for risk management. Somebody, a risk management person needed to get on the 17th floor to understand what was going on, let alone challenge what was going on. It just didn't happen. Another knock against Bernie's risk culture. And then there is the fear of bad news component, uh, a culture where management and employees feel inhibited about passing on bad news or learning from past mistakes. Uh, that's, that's horrible when that happens, that somebody doesn't feel like they can surface a risk without being chastised. 
that's one of the things that I looked for when I was hiring people. I looked for people, you know, the expression is with backbone. I looked for people that would tell truth to power. If there was something wrong, I wanted people to be able to have the confidence and the knowledge about what was going on to be able to share it with me and to work out a, 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 a solution for it. So instead of hiring high school dropouts like Bernie did, I like to hire people that I thought were inquisitive, but honest. That sometimes uh, not saying something is lying by omission. By not surfacing a risk is lying. It's lying by omission. So, um, you know, that's part of the culture too, that you have to get over this fear of bad news. Another issue could be a company has indifference to risk issues. Uh, some companies respond too slowly to risk issues. Uh, some companies like to beat the system. Uh, Bernie was somebody who wanted to beat the system. And then gaming, a culture where individuals take risks which benefit the unit but are out of line out of line with the organization's risk appetites. And that, that was pretty much uh, Nick Leeson. Uh, and we, we've spoken about this before, but it's worth saying again, find it, ex as find it, assess it, mitigate it, or accept it as a cost of doing business. It's, uh, like when you're making a loan for somebody, again, there's an expectation that there will be some losses and you take that expectation and those losses in order to make money. So you don't do zero business, you take an appropriate amount of risk to get your business off the ground. Not no business, but the right, um, not no risk, but the right amount of risk. Um, Okay, risk appetite determines whether a company considers a level of losses to be acceptable or not. Business line risk taking stakeholders uh, express whether they feel the risk to be high and in need of mitigation or whether they're acceptable. That's part of the whole appetite question. But corporate wide risk committees should have the final word on what the acceptable risk is. Is it any benchmark that they're using? Sure, they'll have, a, they'll have different benchmarks for, depending on, let's go back to the loan example. A benchmark for risk would be the number of delinquencies that you have. And if delinquency yeah. is, is somebody who is 30 days past due or 60 days past due, and if you have a business where everybody is 90 days past due and not paying you any money, then your, your risk appetite is too much. It's too great. You're willing to take on too much risk and, and you have to adjust your underwriting parameters so that most of the people aren't 90 days late. Um, hmm. Okay, and, and they might say as benchmark something like total annual operation risks will not exceed 1% of revenue. That's, so they use the revenue as... That, that's, a, that's a pretty common one. Uh, or it could be somebody just saying total annual operation risk losses will not exceed 500 million. You know, you pick a good number. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, another risk we, we talk about is the risk of people, you know, not knowing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. so part of the risk appetite should be setting a metric and a benchmark for employee turnover. Like you don't want employee turnover to be more than say 15% a year because then you're training too many people, too many people are coming up the learning curve and there are too many mistakes being made. So one metric 
to avoid that is your employee turnover rate. Um, there could be a something in the risk uh, profile of the company that says high risk audit items will be resolved within 90 days. Um, and then, um, you know, more and more of that, that you know, this needs to be escalated to this level, has to go to this level. It, it should all be specified. Like what you were just asking, benchmarks are a good way to do it. Um, you know, I'll say this almost every class, but uh, you can't measure it. You can't manage it if you can't measure it. So that's why it's good to have benchmarks and to track your performance against the benchmarks. Um, Look at that slide. And then, okay, and I'm serious about this cheating. Uh, a major issue, especially with big companies, is that managers come and go. And let's say that you're managing a loan unit that makes loans. Okay. You know you're going to be the manager there for two years. You also know that it usually takes a couple of years before most borrowers become delinquent, right? When you've underwritten them, they're going to be pretty good for the next few months or year because you just checked everything out. But a lot of things could happen over the course of two years and you get some people that are behind, okay? So say I'm the manager and I know I'm only going to be there for two years. I could take on a lot of risk in order to a lot of potential risk that I know won't materialize until down the road, I could take on that risk in order to maximize my volume of sales now, okay? And I do that knowing that if I maximize my volume of sales now, I will get a big bonus this year and no one's ever gonna penalize me for all the risk that I've taken because next year when bonuses are being handed out, I'll be gone. I'll be someplace else and get a bonus from them. There's a lot of cheating like this. So again, that reinforces the need for an independent risk management function. Get it? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk, we've, we've only got about a half an hour left. So let's do another couple of fun little cases from my background, or maybe one. Before you get into that, can I ask a question really quick? Sure. Like in terms of this being a job in the future, is this more finance-based or management-based? Um, like, I'm just kind of confused with like, I don't need to, but like, is it, I guess, is this class more like how to manage people properly or is this, do you know what I'm trying to ask? I thought I did, but now I'm not so sure. Maybe I'm going on too much, but all right, answer what you thought I asked, I guess. That's probably, I'm not really sure what my question is. I'm just. Were, were you asking where the risk management function really resides? Does it reside within yeah. finance or does it reside within some other area? Right. It just kind of feels, yeah. Yeah, well, that is confusing. And, and, you know, it depends on the organization, but as long as it's independent, that's what really matters. Um, I, I didn't show you these org charts because you can look at them on Blackboard, but, uh, you know, you can have uh, a chief risk officer who reports to the risk committee. And I was the chief risk officer. I reported to the risk committee. And I would have market risk, credit risk, and operational risk reporting to me, okay? In some cases, to answer your question, it's the chief operating officer or the chief financial officer that is really overseeing a lot of the risk. I don't recommend that. That's a very conflicting. It is, right? There's a big conflict of- because if, if he's doing something wrong in the finance and then he's covering on the other shop. 
you know, it's, it's That's cheating the system. <laughs> yeah. That's like this guy, Nick, that did everything. <laughs> it, it gets worse than that. Oh, okay. When uh, I was the director of finance, no, when I was the director of credit and risk management for the student loan business, our CFO quit. So then I was, in addition to being the head of, uh, head of credit policy and risk, I was the CFO. There was such a major conflict of interest at that point. I, I'm still baffled about why senior management would even allow that to happen. And uh, you know that went on for a little while. And I, I basically left and went on to another <laughs> business. It was just crazy. Uh, well, you could have done whatever you wanted, no? That's what I tried to do. <laughs> Okay, did I talk about the, I did talk about the life insurance that we tried to sell our bank card customers, right? Oh, the protection insurance, yeah. Well, not the protection insurance. Yes. I talked about the life insurance where we didn't underwrite people and we had a lot of AIDS cases. Did I talk about oh, that? I don't, I don't believe that. so, no. Yeah, no. I don't no. believe so. Okay. We can talk now. We can. Um, when I first started, uh, there was a very clear uh, distinction between banks and insurance companies. Even though um, they're both financial service companies, banks weren't, they weren't able, they weren't allowed to get into insurance and vice versa. And that's just something left over from the depression. They didn't want a lot of insurance claims risking the health of a bank, okay? So in 1986, when I started, when I got out of business school and I was working for the bank, the bank wanted to get into life insurance because it's profitable, but we really weren't allowed to. So what we did is we worked with an insurance company and we passed the customer fees on to them, the insurance company as as uh, premiums, and they're the ones that took the losses. They're the ones that took all the risk. We would collect money from the customers. We would keep a little bit. We would pass the rest of it on to the insurance company. And out of that amount, they would make their profits and, and pay their claims. Okay. So we in the bank designed the process for underwriting these people that wanted the insurance. And our process was basically nothing. If you could write your name and say, I want the insurance and send it back to us, you would get the insurance. Just bundle up. What's that? Like bundling up, like just adding to it, that's all. Well, it was, it was actually separate. Um, oh. we, were, we were really, um, and we were limited in our ability to bundle anything because we weren't even supposed to be in that business. Oh. We wanted to be a one-stop shopping place. And so did everybody else. We wanted to be a one-stop financial services place. You had your account with Citibank, you could get your mortgage, you could have your checking account there, you could buy your life insurance, you could buy your car insurance. That's what we wanted to do. But we couldn't take the insurance risk. So we had an insurance company that we used, but we kept a lot of the upfront money. Okay, we designed the, pro the process to underwrite people, not the insurance company. They had very little input into it. It was almost as if they didn't care. So the underwriting process was minimal because we in the bank card business wanna make things easy for our customers. You don't want to make them answer a lot of questions. You want to make life easy for them. And some uh, insurance companies for life insurance underwrite heavily. They ask you whether, they, whether you smoke or not. Sometimes they come to your office or your house and they give you a physical, okay? And because they've examined you and they know that you seem pretty healthy, 
they will write you an insurance policy. They will give you insurance at uh, a relatively reasonable cost because you've just been underwritten and it doesn't underwritten and it doesn't look like you're going to drop dead tomorrow. <laughs> okay. With Citibank's insurance, since it didn't didn't ask you any questions, the um, expected losses claims for death benefits was higher, okay? We expected higher amounts. But uh, what we did to mitigate those higher uh, claims expenses is that we had to charge the customers more. Instead of uh, $10 a month, what they would be charged if they were underwritten and had a physical, we charge them, I'm making up numbers, $50 a month something like that for the same benefit because they were just riskier. Okay, it wasn't enough. The, uh, the amount that we were charging, almost gouging the customers, wasn't enough. And the claims expenses were higher than what we were charging the customers. And it was because of our process. It was our operations process. And what that was is, don't ask the customer too many questions. And one of the questions that a life insurance company normally asks is who is the beneficiary? Who gets the money, okay? And in, in 1986, nobody was asking who the beneficiary was. They weren't checking it. They just had a, a, a name that was good enough. There was a beneficiary, check it, move on. What the bank didn't do then and I'm not so sure they'd be able to do easily now with more regulations is the bank didn't look to see if the beneficiary was of the same sex as the person taking out the life insurance policy. So it turned out that a lot of people who are HIV positive were able to get this insurance, this life insurance, and they were able to get it because Citibank wasn't underwriting them. So there were huge losses and basically the business was discontinued, okay? Uh, not a very good story. There were actually, there were actually, um, you know, billboards, I'm not billboards, but there were, um, you know, magazines, flyers, they didn't have the internet much then that would, that would coach people who are HIV positive go to Citibank to get this insurance because you'll be able to collect the benefit and nobody's gonna underwrite you. They, they were actually coached, coached you know, nationally to do that. And it was all because of a really bad process. Um, so categories of operational risk. Internal fraud, yes or no? Technically, yes. Technically, yes, internal fraud. Let's hear it, make your case. I'm thinking because, well. Go ahead, change your mind. I'm, I'm thinking more inten intentional, something that. I think there's like, a lot of external fraud. There would be on a life insurance policy, but since we didn't ask them anything, there's really no way they could commit fraud. So, so, you know, I don't-, I don't Oh, okay. That. I was more attached to the part of not asking, but yeah, I guess that's fine. So I, I don't see a lot of internal fraud or external fraud there. There's no questions asked answered, so that's good. Employment practices and workplace safety, I don't, I don't see that. Clients, products, and business practices. Business practices. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of head shakes. I'm gonna give that a check mark. Okay. Damage to physical assets. Is it in that category of operational risk? No. So you don't need anybody that works with physical assets to come to come to your rescue. Business disruption or systems failures? Mm, no, really. Yes or no? Let me look at it. I don't, is I don't it that the that. system is like how they 
vetted the people that they were going to insure? Is that considered a system or yeah, not? You know, it, it is, but that's I mean, more IT. For the purposes of this class, let's let's try to call systems the IT systems, the technology. And and I don't see that, and I'll, I'll make that clear on what I do. Um, I don't see that as a big problem here. I just see the clients, products, and business practices, and also the last one, execution, delivery, and process management. It was just a simple miss. And I don't know why the underwriters didn't really pick up on it at the bank, or not, I mean, at the insurance company. It was a big fail at the insurance company not to audit what we were doing because we in the bank had no expertise in insurance and we were making it up as we went along. So it turned out to be a pretty bad story. But then, you know, there were tens of thousands of people that got life insurance benefits too. So, I mean, that's the good part of the story. Okay. do one last one. We had a, um, just give me a second here. Um, when I was the director of credit policy at the student loan business, I was, uh, having been a student myself, I was pretty aware of the fact that the amount of student aid that you could get, plus the amount of loans that you could get, a lot of times fell short of what you needed to go to school. Now for international students, it was particularly difficult because they weren't even eligible for the federal student loans. They're not still. So what we decided to do is come up with a private loan. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't part of the federal government. It was a uh, student loan that was, the, the risk was all on Citibank. Um, and we thought, you know, if these are all students, they're college students, they'll be responsible and they'll pay us back. But it turned out that uh, the losses that we suffered were massively higher than our expectations, massively, massively higher. And the reason that was, is that we underestimated the number of international students who would return to their home co country and just not pay the bank back. And, you know, you, you get that all the time here for even students, American students that don't pay us back. International students, it was a little bit worse and the losses weren't acceptable. They were too high for our profitability. So we made, so that was, you know, sort of a process failure, I think, because we needed something else that we didn't have in the application. We started doing it. It turned things around. What we added was a co-signer. Yeah. In order to give the person a loan, we made them get a co-signer. A U.S. co-signer? Co-signer that actually was a U.S. citizen. U.S. Okay. Okay. So we added that, losses went way down, and the, pro the product, the international product took off, took off. So initially, though we had that big hiccup, there was a big operational risk and we had huge credit losses. Do you see that as internal fraud? No, not really. External fraud? Well, I, I saw some external fraud there, a lot of external fraud. And, and even external fraud 
from the co-signers that were giving us a lot of bogus information about their- Oh, practice. that they were lying about it. Yeah, so not oh. too, but we had a lot of external fraud. Uh, employment practices, no. Client mm -hmm. products and business practices, I think so. Yeah. Damage to physical assets, no. Disrupt business disruption and IT failure, no. Mm -hmm. Execution delivery and process management. You know, the problem is, is that those two categories are so much alike that if one is uh, if one is uh, appropriate, they both are. But we'll give the check to both of those: clients, products, and business practices, and execution, delivery, and process management. We'll make a note of this. Okay. The source of this risk, was it people? The person doing an activity makes an error? Uh, it could be an error. Um, that's not the most compelling reason, unless you wanna blame it on the people who came up with the credit policies. Which, you know, like I say. It's, no, it's, I mean, that was a good, uh, you know, trying to get the business running and all that. But what, what I'm thinking is, it, I guess it was how the processes were in place to how to approve people. I guess that was not more people there. I, I get it. Like, I'm just doing analysis in my head. <laughs> After people, we do processes. The process that supports the activity is flawed. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Was that is that relevant? Yeah, that's an easy one. Uh, didn't look like the IT system. There was any problem with it? Mm -mm. And there wasn't necessarily an external event that caused this. The source of the operational risk seems to be the process, or in this case, more specifically, a lack of a process to really ensure that we got our money back. So there were credit losses all over the place for this. And they had to stick them in operations losses because they thought you know, it was just such a blunder that that was really the only place that those losses could be reported. Okay. So, so is it basically the way it worked out through this case? This is more experimental type of situations, which actually the risk is quite high to begin with, <laughs> to try out like a new line of business and then trying to build it up and then you know calculate all the losses. So it's like the risk itself. We try. We we did things to mitigate the losses that weren't enough. We would have given loans to you folks because we would give it to people in upper, uh, management MBA programs and MS programs in business because you people get jobs. So we would give you the loan. Uh, somebody in the College of uh, Arts and Sciences may not be able to find employment so easily. So we might not have been as likely to give loans in that that college and the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, whatever the case was, mitigating it that way wasn't enough. We needed to mitigate our losses by putting somebody else on the hook. And after a while, the business thought, you know, that wasn't such a bad idea. And they started asking for a co-signer for all these student loans, all these private student loans. Um, that's, that's about all I want to give us for tonight. Does, any, does anybody have any questions about this or anything else? Um, I actually wanted to ask whether it's possible to have the slides before the class. How soon before the class? Um, weekend. <laughs> 
What if I try to get them to you the day before the class? Yeah, works for me. Just to follow with you what you say and take some notes on the slides. Okay, you know, I've done it both ways and I determined at some point that I wanted to be able to interact with people and if they had their slides in front of them, less of that was happening. But I can also understand why you would want them before the class. Uh, it doesn't hurt anybody to get them before the class, so you're all going to say that's what you want, and that's what I'm going to do. Okay? I'll try to get them to you the day before the class. And if I don't, you can't penalize me. You can't hold it against me. Okay? But I, I have most of, the, most of the stuff done a few days before the classes. Yeah, if not, if it's not possible, I mean, it's not a big deal. I just wanted to ask, I mean... Oh, Sandra, it's a good question. It's fair enough. I'll do it. I can accommodate. Thanks. That. I will. I will try to accommodate that. Okay. Professor. Yeah. Just a quick question. I know we have a quiz coming up in a couple of classes. Um, so is that going to be mostly on the reading, or the the reading and uh, the slides and the stuff that we go over in the class? Both. Both. Got it. If anything, I would say a little less on the reading. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, the, to, for, for you to know the details of, of Bernie Madoff, you know, what he had for breakfast is not that important to me. Right? <laughs> Got it. And Well, you know, maybe if he, we knew what food he ate, maybe we can try to that food and see. <laughs> what, what, yeah. I, I'm just, you know, trying to supplement it uh, with the book, just like I would be trying to supplement it with if you see any of the videos. Uh, about Bernie, which I do recommend, by the way. Um, but what's more important is that you look at the lecture notes. But I highly, highly recommend that you uh, read the book too. But like I say, some minutia in the book, and you can be a judge of what's minutia. I don't care about it. I'm not going to ask you any names. I'm not going to ask you any oh, okay. market making business. I'm just going to ask you uh, some some questions about Ponzi schemes and you got it draw from the books from the book. Got uh, it. And will that will that quiz happen like during class? Or? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, Great. Thank you. The way it'll work is the way I usually do it is I email it out to everybody. I'll email it out to everybody at six o'clock and then give people an hour and they return it to me. Email it back. And for this quiz, it'll be multiple choice. There are 50 of you. And so I'm going to say, I, I got to save my strength for essays later. This, this one is going to be a uh, multiple choice. I might work in an essay, but I, I'm, I'm, I doubt it. Uh, and what is that week four? I think it's week four. Yep. We, I believe so. so it'll just yes. It'll so it's after this week? No, this, this is week two, so. Uh, two weeks from now. Oh. I think we also have a week off, right? We have a week off in there as well. I think week four, there's no class. Yeah. Oh, On the yeah. 16th of September, the school is closed. Yom Kippur. Oh. Another uh, yeah. That's one of the names. On, on, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Okay. I, I should look so Thank you. syllabus for days off. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything else from anybody? Uh, Professor, I have a question like I was going to ask you like in the first session. Um, about like, I mean, Ponzi scheme, like for Barney Meadow. So um, actually, I'm, I'm actually from Bangladesh. So we had a, some kind of like a, scheme like at the time at the same time so you, you give your money they're gonna give you like twice double double it like i mean within like 40 or 45 days but nobody gonna nobody got their money so does it like i mean fall into like ponzi scheme or those kind of things sure sure sounds like it from what you told me <laughs> yeah I, I, I don't know it sounds like it could be yeah it was it was it didn't go off like i mean the guy got caught like i mean like with Sarah's thousand thousands uh, Bengali like currency at the same time. 
So all of them like lost their money. Okay, so what do we talk about next week? Okay. Do the last stuff that will be on the talk. Oh, risk identification though. Um, yeah, it's actually two contracting deals kind of dry, so I'll throw in some case studies. Okay, everybody good? Yes. Okay, and we'll see you next week. Good night, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Good night. Thank you, Professor. Good night. Thank you. Good night.